You're listening to the Work Cultured Podcast, where good companies keep good company. Hey, welcome to the Work Cultured Podcast. Today we have our guest, Brandon Metcalf, CEO of Place Technology and also the founder and CEO of many other companies and also a podcast host himself. So Brandon, welcome on the show. Hey, thanks for having me on. Yeah. So before we dive in too far, so you started your own podcast in uh, what, August, July, August? Yeah, about there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. How's that going so far? I mean, I love it. It was uh, it was not something I ever thought I would do. Um, so I hired a, a new VP of marketing for Place in the beginning of 2022, and it was his idea to launch the podcast. And um, I basically said I would do whatever he wants me to do as long as he can drive inbound sales, which he's done a brilliant job of. But what I didn't realize is I actually love doing the podcast. It's been, been a lot of fun. And it's one of my favorite things I do now. That's, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, and, and and you you started place in 2018. Is that right? Yeah, I mean we started to get going in 2018. We started software development in 2019. We really kicked off sales in the beginning of 2020, um, and been going ever since. Awesome. And it's what your third, fourth company to start on your own. Place was my second company. I had another company called Talent Rover before that, which was a, a software for the global staffing and recruiting industry. I launched Place um, at the same time. I launched Place right after my last company got acquired. So we got acquired by our biggest competitor in March of 2018. Um, and then I launched Place in August of 18 after after a short stint with the company that bought us. Um, so idea was to solve the pain that I lived at Talent Rover for financial forecasting, financial visibility throughout the organization and, and all of that. At the same time, um, a lot of people who knew me um, were hitting me up for some consulting work. So I started doing some consulting as well on the side, and that's what launched my other company, Blueprint, which is uh, really a Salesforce consulting firm. We help other companies build Salesforce based products. Um, so two companies that once was never really a goal, um, it just kind of landed in my lap and, um, blueprint does all of the implementation and customization services for place customers. So that's beneficial. Oh and yeah. Then, that is what kind of intertwined there. Yeah. I mean, so it's all, everything I'm doing, it may seem like there's a lot of different things, but they're all actually kind of related. Um, so then blueprints was doing that work. Um, and then really the beginning of this year, um, we started talking with Salesforce on advising them of recruiting and HR stuff inside of Salesforce. Um, and that led us to create a, another company, another product called Assemble, um, which is a recruiting software again. So Talent Rover was a recruiting software. Place is a financial forecasting, subscription management, billing software. And now Assemble is a recruiting software as well. But you know, the only reason I can do everything that I'm doing is one, is everything's in the same ecosystem, so everything's in Salesforce. Um, and then two, Blueprint and Assemble, I really have someone that runs those companies on a daily basis. So um, I probably spend 15, 20% of my time on Blueprint Assemble and the rest of my time all in place. Okay, gotcha, yeah. Uh, you're actually the second uh, uh, guest we've had that who's technology whose company is uh, an integration with Salesforce uh, oh, cool. seems to be pretty popular. Yeah. And I was yeah. I mean, I was definitely one of the earlier ones back in 2009 when we started to conceptualize uh, talent river being built on Salesforce. It was the wild, wild west. Everyone thought I was <laughs> nuts for building a software, especially when we were raising money because we raised $28 million for, for that company and uh, institutional investors at that time had a hard time understanding um, the value and then the, the economics of building a product on Salesforce. Now, after companies like Encino have gone public and you have Viva and like just a whole litany of massive companies built on the platform, the landscape has changed quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what I'm seeing on like your LinkedIn, for example, is a massive amount of hours put into that. And so my curiosity goes to like, how, how does a guy lead multiple teams, 
doing that much work and still have a almost 90% approval rating by your current and former employees. I mean, that's, an, that's impressive as I was kind of, you know, researching and, and learning all about you. So can you tell me, is there, do you have a, a, a secret to that, that balance or what's, you know, where do you, where do you get that? Yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, for me, for balance, I learned a lot at, at Talent River because I was working all the time. I, I'm passionate about work. I like, I don't have uh, a work-life balance. I just try to have balance. <laughs> um, that's how it works. Um, you know, that company, we had nine offices in eight countries. So I would literally spend two weeks uh, a month just traveling around the world, seeing customers or seeing the other offices. So you get you get really efficient when you have to be away that much of how do you get your day to day done because you're always kind of on a plane or somewhere. Um, so I learned a lot from that. And then I also learned a lot from my, my business partner at that company who was my boss before we decided to launch the company about just how do you interact with people? Um, like subtle things. Like he taught me that you never, if you're out with someone that works with you, it's, you know, it's never, Hey, this is someone who works for me. This is someone who works with me. Um, we all just have different roles, um, and different responsibilities that come with those roles. Um, but I've learned, you know, that to, to really just, you know, we do just have different jobs and, um, everyone is working as hard as they can and treat them like that. And, um, I think that's, that's been really beneficial. The other thing is just trying to be as transparent and radically candid as possible. Um, which I don't always get right, but try. And it's always been a work of like, I think people should generally know what's going on and know how they're doing. And um, like subtle things like, you know, how's the company doing? How much cash do we have in the bank? All of those types of things, I think helps build a culture that, you know, we're all in this together um, and we're all trying to achieve the same goals. And um, uh, building startup companies is brutal. And I think a lot of companies don't look at it that way. And I think if you do, it just helps softens the stresses. And like one of our core values is enjoy the journey um, because you pretty much get your butt kicked on a daily basis with trying to build a company, right? And if you don't take a step back and say, okay, what's the positive stuff that's happening? That's where you get burnout and all of that. So I think just trying to be as human as possible. Although I'm not a very uh, emotional guy. <laughs> so I'm pretty stoked when it comes to that. Um, but it's something I've really learned of, of the importance because I do genuinely care about everyone that works with us. Um, sometimes it just doesn't, uh, it's not as easy for me to share that because it's just because I'm not super emotional. Sure. Have you read uh, Radical Candor? What is it? Kim, Kim Walker? Is that her? her yeah, name? I almost had her come into our leadership meeting oh, nice. this past quarter um, and we couldn't get it to coordinate correctly. But um, yeah, I think um, that whole concept is, is spot on. Yeah, we, we do end up talking about psychometrics and how they play into our leadership styles. Um, you sent me your, your culture index and your L was a 10. Uh, not surprising to, I mean, our listeners don't exactly know what that means. Uh, I'm a nine. And so it is that, that just hardwiring lack of um, wearing emotions on our sleeves, right? So we really have to like do the work to tap into that, um, you know, awareness of other people's emotions, what they're feeling and everything like that. Uh, I'm curious, I, I turned to Brene Brown and, and, you know, like learning from her that empathy is something that is a skill that you can actually hone. I'm curious if you've done something similar or what you've kind of, uh, leaned into, to tap into that aspect of things. Yeah. I mean, I would say the same, um, you know, talking with, uh, peers. So I'm part of a uh, entrepreneurs organization, which I love. That's my peer group where I can go and be honest and see who's who and how they manage similar situations. And, um, what's funny, we use cultural index in our forum there as well. So we know how everyone's hardwired. Um, also leveraging just mentors and, 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 and people that know me personally that I can be open and honest with about what I'm thinking and reacting to, but then also like seeking feedback from people at, at work as well. Um, just seeing how things are going, seeing what the reactions are and all of that. Um, I read a lot. Brene Brown's great. Anything similar to that is great. Um, but it's just really trying to always have the mindset, which is hard, of, of people aren't wired the way that I'm wired. Um, not everyone. And thankfully, not everyone is wired the same way that I'm wired because yeah, it right. would be a very not emotional group of people. Um, but I think leveraging tools like Culture Index or or similar ones um, really help bring it to the surface. So like when we hire someone in the company, 
we share my culture index um, as a way to talk about culture index and to talk about personality so that, you know, these, these, these surveys of, about how you're hardwired, um, I think they're really helpful from a communication standpoint. So you can understand why someone communicates the way that they do, um, which is why we decided to do it in the first place. And it's yeah. just worked really well. Yeah, I, I used uh, uh, both the culture index and predictive index uh, at my last company. And that's funny. We have some, some parallels, uh, sold the company, stayed on with them for a while, you know, just to kind of do that, that uh, transitional uh, stint and then uh, got into consulting. So it's just kind of funny, the, the parallels uh, in our lives. But uh, mine's a little more recent, so I'm still figuring things out. Uh, so we, we did skip our, our, our main question. So I'm going to, I'm going to backtrack. <laughs> we'll come back to like reading right. and I want to hear some of the books that have uh, had an impact on you, but, uh, we like to ask every guest to the same question kind of right out of the gate, uh, which, you know, we're already a few minutes in, that's okay. Uh, but what is a mistake that you've made in leadership that you'll never forget? Wow. Well, there's a, I mean, there's a lot. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, everyone kind of says the same thing. Every, everyone's like, well, just one or, uh, <laughs> I mean, it's the whole premise. Well, it's, it's sort of the premise for my podcast as well. It's not a mistake, but my podcast is more about what's a big challenge you had to overcome and all of that. Yeah. Cause you never hear a lot about that stuff. You know, I mean, I think, um, thinking just through my history, I think, um, sometimes over reacting to, or reacting too quickly. Um, I can think of times where, you know, something happens and before getting all the fact, there's a reaction that happens um, of like, why does this happen? How are we going to change this in a sense of, you know, fear or something like that coming in as to the impact of the business and then the communication um, based off of that reaction not going well. That's one of the things with my personality type that I'm always mindful of is like, okay, before you react, let's think through this. The other side of that is I'm also a very data driven person. So I like to have as much data before I make a decision as, as I can as well. Um, there's that. I think um, earlier in my career, um, I wasn't as thorough with doing things. Like, for example, I used to run technology for a staffing firm and I was doing um, a revamp of all of the infrastructure for the company. It's actually where I came up with the idea for for my first software company as I was so frustrated with the software that we were using. I thought I could build a better one. Um, but I was working on replacing our telephone system um, because we got hacked and all of a sudden we had all of these charges okay. from some foreign country of routing through our server to, to do long distance stuff. Wow. Um, and I was working with the, the vendor and I ended up signing a contract that I thought was specifically for one of our offices. And what I ended up signing was extending our contract for like five years for all offices. Um, and it was a pretty expensive mm -hmm. mistake that we couldn't get out of. Um, so I learned the importance of contract review and really understanding <laughs> what you're signing very, very well. On the flip side, I also learned, I had, uh, one of our attorneys do, I, I just randomly asked him, I'm like, Hey, can you do me uh, some analysis on it was some new labor law or something that came out and he's like, great, we'll go do it. And then I got a $30,000 bill later. I was like, wait, this was just a simple question. I didn't think we were doing yeah. it. So the thorough, thoroughness of all of that um, was definitely big lessons. Um, you know, I've, I've learned a lesson of the importance of managing cash flow when we almost ran out of money and needed a quick $300,000 invested into Talent Rover in order to cover payroll around the world um, because we weren't managing cash that well, which is part of the reason why we created, you know, place to help companies do that. Mm -hmm. So... It's kind of all over the place as to the mistakes. Luckily, there's nothing been too devastating that you can't recover from. But I think, I think one of the reasons why mistakes um, haven't really derailed me is the openness and transparency about, crap, I screwed up. This is what happened. How do we recover from this as quickly as possible so that you have enough time and you build enough trust with those people that you work with that you, know, you can own your mistakes and move past them? Yeah, I think a leader admitting a mistake and instead of blaming or pointing the finger somewhere else, I think that can be one of the most powerful trust building uh, exercises or, or, or actions that we can take. Um, people really, really respond to that well. Um, yeah. You, know, you see so much blaming and, and everything else going on in the society. Nobody wants to own their own mistakes. But when you do, it, it's just it's super easy to move through. Yeah, and as a leader, like you're gonna make a ton of decisions rapidly. Like that's that's part of the job. 
Um, and I think one of the qualities of a good leader is you get most of them right. Um, but you're not going to get all of them right. And for the ones that you get wrong, what did you learn? Um, how did it shape your, your future decision making? Um, and how do you move past it? Because um, I think there's also the harm if you make a mistake. If you can't get past the fact that you made that mistake, then it's going to do you more harm um, than the actual mistake itself. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if you're down on yourself, if you, if you go from uh, just the recognition of a mistake to the shame of, oh, I am a bad leader, I'm a bad person, whatever else it might be. Again, we're tapping more into that Brene Brown stuff, but it's really powerful stuff. Totally. So, yeah. Uh, so you're at Place Technology. What's, how many employees do you have now? Um, I think we have 50 to 60. Okay. Yeah. I saw 60 on LinkedIn, but you know, sometimes there's more that, that don't necessarily have a LinkedIn. Yeah. Um, and then your previous companies about how many employees did you have when you sold? In talent over 120, 130, 140. I forget exactly, um, how many, um, we had, um, let's see. And then blueprints, we probably have 15 employees or so. Assemble the new recruiting software. We we'll probably have seven to eight or so. Um, it gets hard because even with my current companies, um, our US teams are actually fairly small. Um, we have a big operation in Jaipur, India, yeah. um, which is where most of them sit, which is all of our de development, product, engineering, all of those, which is awesome. It's the same thing I had with Talent Rover where we had a really big team in Hyderabad. Um, and one of the guys that was our leads at Talent Rover now runs all of that over um, for us for Place and, and the other company. So we also, we lease employees from each other as well. So like mm -hmm. Place will hold most of the employees and then lease the engineering employees to Blueprint and Assemble, um, which is a really capital efficient way of having offshore teams um, because now I don't need to have like Place as the U.S. entity and has a Jaipur entity. Assemble has an entity in the U.S. Blueprint has an entity in the U.S., but I don't, I don't have to have more India entities for Blueprint and Assemble. It's all under place. So yeah. uh, some capital efficiency gains and, um, that we have there. And the folks in Jaipur, they are uh, employees, not mm -hmm. uh, contracted with a separate third-party company. All full-time employees. Yeah. Um, it's also really important everyone gets equity in, in whatever company they're working for. So everyone has equity across the companies as well. I think that's oh, critical. I mean, we're all building this together. We all should get the reward together once something eventually happens. No, that's incredible. Yeah. Uh, and you don't have to share how much, but uh, what, you know, how much equity you're giving out there. But I'm curious uh, what, if that's something new with Place or if that's something that you've been doing throughout your, your career. Like when did that idea come to you and say, hey, this is important enough to me that I'm gonna make sure it, it happens everywhere? We did it with Talent Rover. Um, you know, that's where it came from. Um, the, my mindset has evolved a lot from Talent Rover with it, where I think, you know, Talent Rover, we would offer equity. Not everyone always took it. So there were some employees who just said, no, I don't want equity, um, which is always, a, interesting. it's interesting to hear as, you know, running the company is like, wait, why would you not want equity in the company that you're working for? Um, it also gives you some indication of where their mind might be at. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that they have doubts about the company. Usually it means they don't understand how equity works. Um, so they don't understand right. the value of it. So there's a bit of an education that goes on there. But with Place and all the all the other companies, it's everyone should have equity um, in the company to some extent. Blueprint is a little different since it's a consulting company. We really aren't structured the same way. But Place and Assemble, everyone does. Yeah, wow, that's really cool. Now I'm I'm curious on that. I mean, is that a thing that you know you've got teams spread out in multiple places? Uh, they're all receiving. I'm assuming similar benefits as far as pay and equity and things like that. So how do you have, I don't know, I, I, the culture just across those teams, across the, uh, the, the opposite sides of the world. Like how do you, how yeah. do you keep them engaged and, and the culture strong in that environment? Yeah. Luckily now we only have two countries versus talent river. We had eight countries, um, wow. with employees on and, um, it's hard, you know, I, I learned at, at Talent Rover that, you know, there's different tricks that we can do. So like one trick that we implemented there is if you ever talk to someone who's not in the same office as you, you had to do it on video, which now it's like, yeah, we all do this. We're all on Zoom, but we're talking like 
2014, 2015, 16. That was not the normal. Yeah. But if you think about it, like our U.S. team and our India team, most of them never got to meet each other. Like it just yeah, wasn't right. a thing. So this is the only way that you can humanize the other person because email or instant message or Slack or whatever, it's easy to forget that the other person on the other side of the world is an actual human with stress and family and kids and things going on and they're trying to do the best they can and all of that. But when you see them and you have those conversations um, visually, it softens um, it a bit and you can actually take a step back to remember that it is a person on the other side of the world. Um, but the global culture piece is, is hard. We try to focus locally um, as much as we can. So our Jaipur team does tons of events with each other. It's always fun because we get to see all their photos and um, they're super engaged. And then here in the United States, for the people that are clustered together, we do usually two team building things a month. Usually one's a lunch and one's some type of happy hour or event or something like that, where the goal of those events is to not talk about work, um, which we actually usually accomplish that goal. Where we're actually just hanging out. How are you doing and mm -hmm. catching up? Um, we can save the work talk for all of the Zoom meetings and all of that stuff on a day to day basis. And that works really well. And you guys are in Austin, is that right? Headquartered in Austin. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And is that where you are or are you somewhere else? Yeah. I'm in Austin. Okay. Yeah. That's what I thought. That's where we are as well. Uh, what, what are some of the things you like to do with the, the local cluster here? Uh, I mean, the last event that we just did top golf. Um, Love it. we do, um, whatever restaurants, restaurants are kind of all over the place as to where we go. We went to, um, everything from Fresa's to, we did, um, I forget the name of the sushi place on, on South Lamar, but it's kind of, we have, we have a culture committee, um, which is a team of about three or four people that they decide what we're going to do. Um, I'm not, I'm not the creative guy for the fun events. So I get them to be the creative people and they get to pick what we do. So we've yeah. done volunteer stuff. Um, uh, just, it's kind of all over the map, but the, the goal is how can we actually hang out um, yeah. for an hour or a few hours and just be present with each other. Yeah. And you're going to those as well, even as, as a CEO. Yeah. yeah. Cause, cause you work with them, not, they don't work for you. And I like that mentality. Exactly. And I can't go to all, I don't go to all of them because of scheduling conflicts sometimes sure, because the same thing with the staff. But the goal is, yeah, let's just go. And, you know, um, I have a different job than they do. And I have different experience than than most of them as well. That doesn't make it better or worse or whatever. It's we all work together. Let's just hang out. Yep, absolutely. So, OK, uh, Jaipur, we you know, we talk a lot about remote work and hybrid work with the, the the folks we have on here, um, we were already tapping into this idea of it's not just remote, it's completely overseas. Uh, you use video. That's a big component of like humanizing the folks that you're working with. Uh, how do you manage the time zone difference? Cause it's what's <laughs> six, seven, eight hours. Well, it's longer than that. Um, is it? Oh, it's like 10 in yeah. Japan, isn't it? Yeah. And then they have this, um, and then when the time zone happens in the United States, it makes it worse. Cause then all yeah. the screwed up so um so we block and tackle so my co-founder uh, at place cabe um who's also an investor in all the other companies um he runs the the engineering side of the house um on a day-to-day -day basis so engineering operations implementation all of that so his days usually start at 4 30 um and he's usually on calls with india until eight or nine in the morning um and then that starts to slow up for him um, the rest of the U.S. team, I mean, typically they, don't, they try to avoid taking any meetings before like 730, um, but it's usually like 730 to 10 is, is a big overlap of meeting time for those that need to interact with each other. And then in Jaipur, they work a later schedule. So they come in later, they stay later, which is generally part of the culture over there because a lot of the yeah. culture is so used to working with the United States sure. that it works. I mean, the friction comes in the late afternoon in the U.S. where... You know, if you ping someone, like if I ping someone on Slack and it's like two o'clock here, I usually get a response. Um, so I try not to do that because obviously it's in the middle of the night for them, um, but they're super responsive. Um, but we make it work. It's, it's interesting when we hire someone in the United States that's never worked with an offshore team. It's, it's more challenging for them to say, OK, how do I block and tackle this and when can I get the answers I need? Um, and then we also have to have processes and people in place where what's the stopgap like it can't be we can't get an answer out of uh, Jaipur at all 
who in the U.S. can bridge the gap to get, get us the answer we need. Um, and that helps a lot. Yeah, I had some developers there as well at my last company and uh, some really hard lessons uh, early on where, you know, for, just process wise, like don't roll out new code at the end of their day. <laughs> it's the beginning <laughs> of our day and I want to see that code. I want to see that bug fix you go and be implemented. But then if it doesn't work, we're screwed for 24 hours. <laughs> yeah. uh, never on a Friday. That's insanity, yeah. right? You never do something new on a Friday code wise. Uh, There's also the, the benefit, though, of like, you know, if I need something and it's the afternoon, my time, if I need that the next day, then they can actually work on it almost all day before I even get to it the next day. So there's yeah. some efficiency. If you, if you manage it right, there's definitely some efficiencies you can also gain um, with, yeah. with the team. It's, it's also interesting, as I was reading Glassdoor, is seeing reviews from people in Jaipur. And one of them even, I think he said, or they said, this is the greatest company in Jaipur. Wow. And I was like, that's cool. That's and then, really of course, cool. my brain goes, and we all, I feel like we ask everyone this, but do you ever find yourself, Brandon, maybe got a few extra minutes and, and you go on to Glassdoor? Do you go on those types of websites and read what people are saying about your company, about you uh, in oh, general? I, absolutely. Or do you leave that to someone? No, no, no. I think um, any of that stuff, like it's my job to be aware of what's out there. Um, it's also like my job to be engaged with, you know, when there's a bad review, like it's yeah. the immediate reaction is like, what the hell? Um, yeah. You got to pull yourself back and say, okay, like there's some, regardless if you agree with the review or not, there's something in there that drove a person to take the time to write the review. Same thing on the positive side. So I try to take a step back and, and work with the leadership team about, okay, what what is this? Like, what's what's causing this? For the person that says this is the greatest company in Jaipur or for the person that says, you know, I hate this company or whatever they say, what's driving it? And do we understand really what's going on so we can work to continuously try to make the environment better? Um, early stage software companies are not for everyone. It's it's a different type of work. Um, we've we've and, and me have learned over the years how to get a little bit better about who to hire for for this type of environment. But you don't always get get that right as well. Um, but you can stay present and and if you try to not take things personal, um, it helps. Um, and it, on both positive and negative, like if you get a great review saying it's the best co company ever, it's like, okay, well, great. We're doing awesome. I'm doing awesome. And maybe I am, but why is that review being written, um, to help you to continuously try to improve, um, the culture, um, and get more people to feel that way. Or maybe you have more people who are upset with the company. Why are they upset with the company? And let me dig in. Cause I may be unaware of something that's driving everyone nuts that needs to be resolved. Yeah. 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 Um, one, uh, a question I wanted to ask you, because I actually couldn't find your core values on your website. And I'm curious what they are, like if you have them you know, off the top of your memory. Because you gave yeah, us I mean, one and it was great. We're actually launching a brand new website because not only are our core values not out there, it doesn't really articulate in a meaningful way what we actually do as a company that right now okay. for, for a place. Um, we're going through an exercise as well with the extended leadership team because we brought on new people this past year where we're adjusting and revising our core values to say, are they still the same as to what they were in 2018? Because I, mm -hmm. I do think um, they need to evolve with the company. I don't think they're a set it and forget it type of thing um, from what I've seen. Yeah. So, you know, some of the ones that we have is build products you believe in. And that's a fun foundational one. Like, do you really believe in what we're putting out as a product and that it will solve a need and that the customers are going to get value from it? Um, show up. Show up and be present. Like when you're working, you're working. You're not there just to check a box. You're there to, to engage and, and to deliver. Get it done. Find ways to overcome obstacles. Um, we are faced with some tasks that we've never been faced with before on a daily basis. How do you manage through it? How do you, how do you overcome it? Um, radical candor. Mm -hmm. You know, be transparent and candid without being a, an asshole um, to people about it. And there's a fine line with how do you manage that? How do you come across wanting everyone to be transparent and open and honest, but also 
not not always have that come across, especially when you're sharing difficult um, feedback as to as to someone's just being rude or, or aggressive. Um, enjoy the journey, like like I was talking about. Um, again, it's it's a crazy ride. I love what I do. Um, a lot of my friends think I'm nuts, um, but I'm passionate about it. I love trying to solve problems that customers have that I've had. Um, and that's what motivates me for, for building companies or running companies. And then everything else comes from that. I like, I like, I love making the team successful. I love making money. I love having people make money. I love all of that stuff. But at the end of the day, I really love solving problems. Um, but because it can be so difficult, it can be frustrating. It can feel like you're taking two steps back every single day. If you get caught up in that whirlwind, you're going to burn out. So if you can take a moment and figure out, you know, some positive stuff that's moving forward um, and really just enjoy the journey itself. It, it is a journey. It's not um, it's not a linear path or it's not a, a straight line, um, but it is a process. And I look back at Talent Rover um, and realized I didn't take the time and I didn't really focus on having the team take the time to say, hey, we're doing some crazy cool stuff here. Like, do we recognize that? Are we enjoying this? It's not just coming in. If we wanted to go have a job, okay, that's, you can get a job anywhere. You can go work for a massive, massive company and, yeah. and kind of get lost and, and just do a job if you wanted to. Um, this isn't that. This is, are we excited about what we're doing? Because it's hard work and um, you may not get paid what you did at a massive multi-billion dollar company. You may, but it's, you, you just look at it differently. Yeah, no kidding. Um, so you, as you're going through with the new executive team, revisiting these core values, is there a process that you're following to kind of hone in on, on what those core values need to be? If they stay the same, if they change what they need to be? Yeah, I mean, the cool part is they mostly are staying the same or just tweaking some of the wording to make it more appropriate or, or more concise. Um, I, uh, we had our, our first leadership summit with, with all of the department heads several months back, um, and it was like a three-day off-site. Um, we stayed here in Austin, but we all stayed at the hotel together and, and all of that. Um, and we had the Arbiger Institute come in for day one. Um, which was brilliant with what they did. So um, they came in and did uh, a presentation about really communication and communicating with each other. Um, and one of the big topics was collusion, which is a funny word after uh, all of the uh, political God. stuff around <laughs> collusion. Um, Dana said, dear God. <laughs> I'm not going there, don't worry. But for, for Arbiter, what, what collusion was is like, look, you can have a relationship with someone. It could be, you know, your spouse, your friend, your coworker, your boss, or whatever. And that person can say something to you, and you're interpreting what they said in a very different internalized way compared to what they may actually be saying. So they could say something to you, and you're like, wow, he just doesn't get what I do. He doesn't respect me or whatever. And that they start to harbor that. So then the response they give back to you is with that mindset and then you interpret that as like what is the deal with this person and you start to all of a sudden get into a conflict with each other mm. that really if you took a step back and had an open conversation you probably wouldn't be in a conflict but there's the per per perception of what's the intent of what's being said and you know they talk about it's, it's sort of like like you guys this is a great example you're both sitting in chairs so when you're in a collusion with each other your chairs are back to back, so you can't see the other person. Mm -hmm. And then as you start to open up the collusion, your chairs start to turn, and you start to see the, see the person, and eventually you're facing each other. And then you kind of break through the noise of you know, what you interpret or what you, you know, are assuming, and you get into actually healthy conversations. So I had that whole process as like the, the first, what, day and a half of the offsite, really just for communication. Um, one of the challenges I think that we had at my first company was um, a bit of a culture of finger pointing at the leadership team mm. where there was so much going on that if something went wrong, it was quick to, well, this is why this is someone else's fault and not mine. Um, and I tried to, to kill that at the end of, of the company um, and never really could get it 
to go away. So with current companies, it's intentional of like, okay, how do we, how do we dress that? How do we call it out? How do we relate to each other? How do we communicate with each other? Because I have a, a belief with my leadership team uh, at Place, the rest of the companies, the leadership teams are a little too small for this yet, but at Place, we actually have department heads. And my, my belief for them is they need to run their department. I'm here to guide, to motivate, to give them the bigger picture of what we're doing, but they own their department. So they should feel empowered to do that. But then when you're dealing with department heads, they also have to have the skill set of how do they collaborate with someone who's their peer and have conversations that will drive the business forward um, without the finger pointing and the blame and all of that. Um, and I thought that workshop was, was really well done and helped us with that a lot. Yeah, it sounds like it would be super helpful. Um, you know, the, hopefully they took that and implemented it at work and hopefully even in their interpersonal lives, right? right? I mean, how often do we tell ourselves a story about a, you know, a friend or a you know, significant other or something like that where you know, we make up what it is they're trying to actually say and it's not at all what they're thinking or saying? Um, yeah, it's a, really, it's a big one. Well, well, I, I think from the work, it's, it's even highlighted even more with the culture of like we're fully remote now um, yeah. in Austin. So when you're not around someone and you're working remotely, you then it's super easy to get in your head and start mm -hmm. like thinking through all of these things that may or may not actually be true. Sure. So the the three day deal you just did with the leadership team and you talked about that collusion, you know, back to back is does everyone on the team participate in that? And is it all just one on one or I, I, that was really interesting. I want to kind of hear more about that. And and is this a thing you're going to continue to repeat quarterly or periodically with the leadership team? Yeah, I mean, so it's a workshop, right? So there's some stuff you do in pairs. Sometimes we just do as a group. Um, Arbinger does a really great job of making no one feel on the spot or isolated or any of those things. Um, so that's great. And there was other parts of that workshop as well. Like how do you work with teams? How do you start to dissect where problems are? Things like that. It's a really, really good workshop that I would definitely recommend. Um, and then we have ongoing training. So we picked three trainers um, that basically train the company. So it's an ongoing, it's not a one workshop. It's, you know, man, meet the, our VP over in Jaipur. He goes through, I think it's once a quarter, um, a, a, a refresh with Arbinger um, of here's what it is. How are you doing? What help do you need and all of that? So it really gets instilled um, because if we're going to have a culture that really embraces that. It's nothing with cultures, you set it or forget it or a one-time thing. It's all intentional work over and sure. over to try to get a behavior to happen. Yeah. I like that you use the word intentional uh, as it relates to culture. You know, I mean, you're on this podcast for a reason. It's because you are intentional about culture and it shows with the awards that you've won, the fact that you're you know growing and um, thriving amidst to this current economy and everything else that's going on. Um, I'm curious, you know, being a founder and, you know, being where you are in your career, can you look back where you actually had to have a boss and you weren't the boss and, and you have examples of when culture was not intentional and, and, you know, do you feel the difference? Oh, absolutely. And you can feel like I'm at where I'm at from a lot of hard work. Um, but also because of the relationships I've built and people who took risks and chances on me. Um, and that comes from, a the right type of mindset with the leader looking at, okay, who can I, who can I elevate or who can I help? Um, so I've had two of those that really stand out in my career. One, when I was in banking with a woman named Gail King, um, when I first started, I was like, when she asked me, she's like, what do you want to do? I'm like, how do I get your job? And she was like a mm -hmm. EVP or something. She was like, okay, well, this is how you do it. I'm like, great. I'm going to go do that. Um, <laughs> and it got me going. I mean, I managed my own bank when I was 21 and like, she really gave me the opportunities and I had to deliver on the second person being Kent. Uh, Gray at, at CV Partners, who became my co-founder at Talent Rover, um, who's now on the board of Place and one of my best friends, where it was the same thing of just the belief in what do you want to do? And, and like the, the story there is I got I was doing executive headhunting, so recruiting like CFOs and things like that. And I was starting to get bored. I got randomly called by Google 
just come in and interview. And when Google calls you to come interview, you go and interview with Google. Um, I went through all of these interviews, got a crazy offer, um, went back to Kent and said, hey, I wasn't looking, but this happened. And he literally said, I can't match that offer, but give me a couple hours and let's talk. Comes back in a couple hours, he's like, hey, you're the most technical guy I know. Someone needs to run technology for the company. Why don't you take over running technology for the company? And I did, and that's what then led to the idea of creating Talent Rover and, and took me in the direction that it took me. So it was that level of relationship and, and trust and, and all of that that got me there, which shaped dramatically shaped. Gail, Gail changed my mind a set early in my career, and Kent took it to the next level. Um, but then I remember I had I was working at um, uh, Kelly um, and, you know, had a boss that was a little bit different from that. And it was more <laughs> difficult and there was friction. Um, and I remember what that feels like. Um, and I would imagine they have a, a similar personality hardwiring that I do um, where I could see myself now early in my career when I was managing people having that same type of interaction where forgetting other people have emotions and they're human and all of that and just trying to get work done and not trying to be like rude or negative about it, but just trying to get the job done and how that can sometimes make people feel. Um, so having both of those experiences really shapes you and gives you the ability to take a step back and say, okay, um, I need to, I need to focus on my emotional side. Um, as much as I need to focus on producing revenue. That's really awesome uh, I mean, to have both experiences, but to have started out even early on, even in your you know, early 20s, maybe, I don't know how long you were there you know, before you're managing it. You said at 21, you were managing, you might've been a teenager when you started there, right? So uh, to have that good of, of an experience early on is, is pivotal. Uh, and then to have the bad experience and that has shaped you. You know, we, we talk about the psychometrics and one of the big things we're trying to get from that is self-awareness yeah. and, you know, w not just being aware, but having coping strategies for those aspects of our hard wiring that uh, can really kind of grade up against our goals, you know, and, and when you know that taking care of people, when you know that culture is important, what do they say? Your know, culture eats strategy for breakfast. If that's true and you can recognize in yourself the parts of your hard wiring that aren't going to be naturally uh, driven to care about those things, then yeah, you, you're able to have those coping mechanisms. And um, you know, you're a venturer and uh, as a, no, sorry, an enterpriser. Yeah. Uh, venture is the, the nickname in, in, uh, in the predictive index world. So high dominance, uh, uh, you know, not so social. Uh, the you're very logical up in your head processing versus heart processing. Uh, gas pedal fast paced yeah yeah you're, you're all, <laughs> your foot on the gas not as so much on the brakes uh, i can really i'm a daredevil uh, so is daniel actually uh, <laughs> you guys have no brakes <laughs> no brakes whatsoever uh if i've taken my adderall i can be really precise and accurate and thorough when i you know if i manage the add side of that but generally speaking no details uh and, and yeah i mean so there's a lot of similar aspects. My, my B is high, my social is high, but it's barely, you know, it's there to kind of serve that high dominance, high autonomy. Uh, yeah, there's been so much learning that, that I've had to do to cope in L of nine, like you said, or like yours is a 10. Um, yeah. So I just, I, I love that you've been able to have those experiences, been able to learn from those things. And, you know, for the listeners, the reason we're kind of on the soapbox is because self-awareness is a huge aspect of leadership. Uh, and, and again, not just recognizing that you are prone to a certain thing, uh, a certain action or behavior or, or drive or need, but also how that's affecting other people around you. And then you get to figure out the coping mechanisms to, um, you know, stay yeah, off those negatives. I know. I mean, I know for me, I definitely don't always get it right. It's still like, it's yeah. an ongoing thing. You always have to focus on and, you know, uh, stress or just life challenges, throw your curveball, you easily go back to how you're hardwired. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes that's not, that doesn't give off the right impression or the right response. And, um, you know, it's a balance too. It's, you don't want to be unauthentic because uh, I think that's, that's also right. not a good way to, to live or to, to lead people. You've got to be authentic. So it's this constant learning and evolving, even with what I do now. I mean, like I said, I still make mistakes but I'm constantly trying to move to the next level. And I'm, for me now, 
It's really I'm trying to get other people to move to the next level, um, which is why I really focus on the leadership team and, and equipping them and letting them be independent, letting them like make mistakes, letting them also succeed and, and supporting them through it. Um, because for me, that's the biggest reward now. It's like I feel like I've accomplished more than I thought I would accomplish, which is exciting and, and nice mm -hmm. to be able to say. I still have a lot more I want to accomplish. Don't get me wrong. Um, but the main thing now is how do I get other people to accomplish things they never thought they would have accomplished? And that's super exciting for me. Yeah. Wow. It's amazing that that is something fulfilling for you to be able to look at other people and say, I want them to feel that sense of accomplishment uh, and pride and what they do. Uh, you said you're a big reader and, and I see some books behind you, but you know, I can't, can't hone in and like see what the titles are. What are some books that you feel have really shaped you uh, or, or maybe just some recent books that, that you would recommend us reading and our listeners and viewers reading? Yeah, I both love to love and hate reading. <laughs> so, um, I like it, but it also, uh, to find the time is, is somewhat challenging for me. Um, but one of the books that I read recently is Super Founder. I thought that was a great book that helps founders talk about their their brand and and who they are and, and all of that. Um, it's, it's similar to what Founder Brand, I think. Um, those are good. I'm always... My one of my favorite books, and I think it sounds cliche because a lot of people bring it up, is "Hard Things About Hard Things." I think it's a really realistic look at, at what it takes to build and run a run a company. Um, those are big. Um, a book I read that most people wouldn't have thought I read. Uh, I don't know where it's at. It's Oprah Winfrey has a book. Uh, oh, right here. nice. Um, well, I'm like, if your first boss was Gail King, you know. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that Oprah's BFF? Different one, different oh, one. Okay. But yeah, so this book. <laughs> I'm sorry um, that I know that. <laughs> Oprah's What I Know for Sure. Okay. It's a fascinating book where it's a bunch of just short stories about things that she's learned and things that she knows for sure. Um, and I'm not a huge, again, emotional, touchy feely type of person. So reading Oprah stuff is not really high on my typical list. Um, but I highly recommend that book. <laughs> Awesome. That's really fun. Um, you know, I know that you're a, a busy guy and we're getting towards the uh, end of our time. Uh, anything that you want to plug, uh, tell us about the podcast, if that's, if that's something, but also, you know, anything that you want our listeners to hear about or look into. When's the new website launch? Yeah. I mean, we've got a lot going on. Um, so one cash and burn comes out every Tuesday. I'm so super passionate about it. And it kind of fits with the theme of this show where, I get to talk to other founders or CEOs or execs in SaaS um, about the biggest challenges or obstacles they faced and how they've overcome them. And when, when we first came up with the idea for the show, it's like, let's talk about the stuff that no one really talks about. Everyone talks about what makes you successful, but anyone who's successful has had challenges and things that's nearly destroyed them. Um, so how do we have those conversations? And uh, the, the guests have been awesome because they've all really opened up and they tell stories um, about those challenges. And I think it's very cathartic for me as a founder to hear from other people about going through similar stuff or other stuff that's even more challenging than things that I've been going through. But then all the lessons you get from it, I think, is, uh, is really powerful. So really passionate about the show. It's a lot of fun. Um, on Place... We have our new subscription management product, which is just on fire, which is super exciting, which is why we got to have a whole new website. So <laughs> the new website's supposed to launch in middle of December. Um, oh, wow. I know the marketing team is uh, feverishly trying to get it done. It looks awesome. Um, so I'm excited about that. And then the other big thing is, you know, we re recently launched the new company, Assemble, which is a recruiting software on Salesforce that has just been on fire out of the gate. So really helping recruiters like solve a problem I don't think any other recruitment software solves, um, and I know this because I built a recruitment software before, <laughs> um, is the workflow. Like recruiting for one type of job could be very different from recruiting from another type of job, but the softwares that you have to use are very rigid as to what your stages are. Yeah. So what we've done is actually created a software which, which empowers the recruiter to create whatever processes and stage they want 
So they can do it all in the system without having to use Excel and all these workarounds that they're all forced to use. So we've been super excited about the reaction to the product that literally launched in mid-September and we already have a handful oh, of wow. customers. So it's oh, pretty that's cool. so cool. Yeah, I, I ended up building a, an HR and recruiting software at my last company, but specific for our company because it was very, very different industry and there was nothing like it. And then, I don't know, four or five, six months into it, I was just kicking myself going, why did I make this so specific to us? If I would have made it more <laughs> modular, I could have sold this thing. Oh, well. Uh, <laughs> right, so, I know, I know. No. If you'd think a daredevil was, would be looking you know, far into the future and not just you know, in, in the weeds, but oh, well. Um, okay, so we're going to end off. We're going to do a little quick fire. So I'm going to ask you just five different questions. It's kind of a this or that. So just right off the top of your head, what comes to mind? First one's easy, iOS or Android? iOS. Okay. Uh, this one might be a little Austin-y, but you know, whatever. Uh, queso or guacamole? Queso. <laughs> uh, would you rather spend money or save money? <laughs> spend money. <laughs> spend money, all right, all right. Uh, coffee or tea? Tea. When you do have time to read a book, you want to read a book or do you want to listen? Audiobook. Oh, that's hard. Like, I mean, as far as a book itself, I would say read a book. Um, but I've now, since launching the podcast, because I've never been in podcasts before, <laughs> now I've just started listening to a bunch of podcasts. So, yep. Yep. Um, but yeah, I, I would read before audio. Gotcha. Yeah, the short form is nice. Podcasts are great. If you're 45 minutes and you get so many golden nuggets as you're listening, uh, you know, doing a couple of commutes. Well, whatever commute it is anymore. I don't, nobody does that anymore. <laughs> but, uh, although I-35 traffic would, would beg to differ. Uh, it seems like people are still commuting, just not Two me. exits on I-35 is a commute, so. <laughs> you know, yeah. Brandon, this was a, a, a great pleasure to have you on the show. Uh, thanks so much for your insights, for your time. Uh, we uh, loved having you, so yeah, thanks. Thank you on, guys, this was great. Well, look forward to seeing the new website too. We were already talking about that earlier, so that is yeah, exciting news. No Carter would love some feedback. So he's been working really hard, him and his whole team. So we're excited to get out there. Perfect. Excellent. Props to the team. All right. Well, this is the Work Culture Podcast, and we are signing off. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Brandon.